Good afternoon. My name is Brian Pick. I'm the Chief of Teaching and Learning for DC Public Schools. And today we're here to talk about curriculum matters. Um, I want to get a couple notes out of the way first. Um, you've chosen to come to a session that's going to talk about curriculum, what students are learning, how they're learning it, when they're learning it. Um, and the work we've done here at DC Public Schools. You're going to hear from two teachers and our curriculum director about what's going well um, and, and what needs to be improved. Um, but there are three important things I want to say at the outset. The first is while we're talking about curriculum, uh, in DC Public Schools, we'll be clear, we don't teach curriculum, we teach kids. And we see curriculum as a tool, uh, and not a, hopefully not a straitjacket, to enable teachers to ignite thing, uh, learning experiences for, for our students. Number two, um, I will be the first to say, and, uh, and I am not an expert on all things curriculum, um, nor are any of our three panelists. We have collective expertise in the district and the city that has helped us do our work. So we are all learning and trying to get better. Curriculum design, uh, my colleague John Davis, our chief of schools, often says, is like taking a stone and trying to polish it so it's perfectly round. It can always be polished, it can always be made better. And we are in that constant polishing of our curriculum. The third one is we've done a tremendous amount of work to create a rigorous academic experience for all of our students. But rigor does not, for us, come at, at the expense of cultural re relevancy. And in fact, we believe you can't actually be rigorous without being culturally relevant. So we're doing a lot of work to make sure that our curriculum is constantly getting better celebrating across difference um, and bringing our students' voices into the classroom. So those are kind of my three first announcements as we go down the curriculum and into the nuts and bolts. As I mentioned, my name is Brian Pick. I'm the Chief of Teaching and Learning. I've been fortunate to be with DC Public Schools since 2008. So this is my eighth year serving in the district. Um, prior to that, I was teaching fourth grade in Oakland. And I did my core member years uh, in the Bay Area teaching second grade in Alum Rock School District in San Jose, California. I want to introduce our panelists today who will be sharing their perspectives uh, on the curriculum work in the district. The first is Corey Colgan. I'm very fortunate to work with Corey closely. She's my deputy chief for literacy and humanities. And I'll let her introduce herself now. Good afternoon. My name is Corey Colgan, as Brian said. I've been with DC Public Schools for almost seven years and had the great pleasure of working with Brian and many other amazing team members. Um, my background is an, as an English teacher, um, a literacy coach, and a school leader prior to coming to DCPS Central Office to work on curriculum and professional development. Great. <clears throat> um, we are also joined by two DCPS teachers. I will note that the panelists are not Teach for America alums, um, but they have dedicated their careers to education here in DC, and I'm happy to bring them to our family. Uh, our first teacher is Ms. Mrs. Ashley Bessex. She is an ELA teacher who's been working on curriculum for several years. She currently teaches at Phelps Senior High School, which is over kind of a Northern Hill, Capitol Hill area in the city. Um, and Ashley also is the proud uh, mother of her first child. She's back at school in January, um, uh, so it's, she, it's good to have her back at the district from maternity leave. I'll let Ashley tell you a little bit about her background. Again, I'm Ashley Bessex. I've been in the district for eight years. I am proud to have served students at Phelps High School. I teach 10th grade, AP, and also 12th grade. Great. Thanks for joining us. And finally, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Terry Thomas. Terry Thomas uh, is an art teacher at Seton Elementary School, uh, just a few uh, doors down from my own home here in DC. I was at Seton on Thursday, and it's really a, a truly incredible place, um, uh, full of joy, but also uh, a tremendous amount of learning happening uh, through fantastic leadership from Principal Kim Jackson, who is our Principal of the Year this year, um, and teachers like Ms. Thomas, who have, who have dedicated to bring curriculum and content to life with their students. Terry, uh, Terry was also the recipient of a Rubenstein Award for Highly Effective Teaching two years ago, I believe, 
Um, so she is one of our very finest. And I'll let Terry tell you a little bit about her path to the classroom. Hello, I'm Terry Thomas. I'm the art teacher at Seton. Seton is right around the corner from here. You can get there in less than five minutes. It's a very um, diverse school, very unique. Uh, we have several key partnerships uh, throughout the city, one being the Kennedy Center. We're a Kennedy Center Partnership School. Uh, they spend a lot of time at our school. Our students spend a lot of time there at Kennedy Center. Other programs such as the architecture uh, in the schools program, uh, the children are citizens through Harvard's Project Zero. So we're involved in a lot of uh, cutting edge curriculum programs. Great. And in, in true to herself form, you will notice that Terry talked a little much about herself and talked <laughs> all about her students and her <laughs> school. Thank you, Terry. And how long have you been there? I'm a veteran teacher. This is my 15th year at Seton. Yes, her whole career at Seton Elementary School. Very lucky students. So today we're going to do, to do three things. Um, first, I'm going to talk high level about the curriculum strategy we've undertaken and the work and why we've done that work. Uh, DC Public Schools and some of the deci decisions we made um, along the way. Then we'll, we're going to dive in a little deeper into our, our actual curriculum. We're going to take a deeper dive into our ELA curriculum to give you a sense and a feel of what it is and how we got there. We've tried to design the session for teachers in the audience, for system leaders, for folks who are interested in the topic of how a, a district might go about its curriculum uh, redesign or curriculum work. And then finally, we're going to talk about something that's very important to us, and that is the student assignment or student task. And we have shared assignments across the district um, that allow for uh, illustration of rigor and authenticity and content. They allow for better professional development, I would argue, because teachers are working on that task. And they all include student work and presentations. So we'll go high level, medium level, and then a deep dive at the task. I put this slide up because I want to say I think all the stuff that the panelists and I are going to share, uh, it has some cred. Like it seems to be headed, we're heading in the right direction. You know, we've made really significant gains over the past eight years on the NAEP assessment, uh, the nation's report card. What you see here are 16 point gains in fourth grade reading, 18 point gains in fourth grade math, eight point gains in eighth grade reading, and 14 point gains in eighth grade math sustained progress and really dramatic growth um, across those measures. It, the TUDA, which is the urban district assessment, it's actually just the same assessment, but the data is sliced across urban districts. You will see that when I arrived in 2008, we had just gotten the results back from the 20, 2007 assessment, and we were essentially at the bottom of the TUDA districts at the time. There were 11 uh, districts signed up. And now we're very happy to celebrate the progress we've made. DCPS is squarely in the middle of the pack here. Um, we are tied with New York on, on fourth grade reading, and we were just above Chicago and New York on, um, on fourth grade math. So good, solid progress. However, we are a park state, and like many of you who are involved in education and have shifted to the next generation assessments, we received some humbling re you know, results this past fall. Only 25% of our students measured uh, on the path towards readiness for college and career in ELA, and 21% in math. So we, have, we know that we've come a long way, but we have a significant way to go as well. We're doubling down on our efforts. Uh, we are particularly concerned about the 31, 24% of students who are at level one um, on ELA and math. And that is you know, the work that we are, we are doing day in and day out to change these numbers and, and thus the life trajectories for our kids. So I will say that there's many things we could attribute um, you know, that growth to, but this is the not so secret sauce of reform in DC public schools. Many of you may know about our human uh, capital efforts to ensure that every classroom and every school is led by an incredible teacher and an incredible principal. And that's around highly effective teachers. We've also done some tremendous work on engaging our students and families. Uh, that work, in partnership with the Flamboyant Foundation and others, means things like school visits and academic meetings about student progress and teacher uh, parents, ways for parents to help with that. But today we're going to talk about the third leg of the stool, 
Uh, one that I would argue is not always the sexiest thing in education, but I'm trying to bring sexy back here, and we're gonna talk about <laughs> curriculum. Uh, curriculum to me is sexy. And it's about rigorous academic content, not just in ELA and math, but in science and social studies, art, music, health, PE, world language, and the career and technical subjects. All of those deserve rigorous, meaningful, worthwhile uh, learning activities for students. And Cora, I don't know if you have some, anything to add on, on that work we've done from the district level on that third leg. Sure. Um, we had the opportunity when the Common Core Standards came out for us to kind of start with a blank slate with curriculum and re-envision what that could mean for our students and our teachers. And I think to Brian's point, we it is something that is not often uh, given as much thought in, in school reform, but we thought about what if every single classroom and every student had the opportunity to engage in the most exciting, engaging, challenging, and meaningful curriculum um, in ways that would really not just um, make school more engaging for them, but actually change their life view about things, change how they thought about themselves, like open doors for them, open the world to them. Um, and so it was a huge weight. It was, it's very, um, there's a lot of enormity in thinking, what am I going to try to help choose that, what text will students read? And is, how is that text gonna actually open doors for that child? But we, we set out to do this um, and we started small. Um, and we started bringing more and more of the DCPS family, um, our teachers, um, coaches, school leaders, in on the conversation. And um, I'm really proud of, of the ongoing work that we're doing, polishing that stone all the time to make the curriculum a, a really powerful uh, part of the DCPS experience. Great. So we had three uh, principles that have guided our academic work. And these principles, they weren't created for this presentation. Uh, they weren't created this school year. They have been around for about six years. And we, we fine tune them and think about them, but they've helped guide our work. The first is focus. Uh, we, it's hard work, right? It's hard work to focus. It reminds me of reading uh, Walter Isaacson's uh, excerpt when J Steve Jobs came back to Apple after being ousted. And one of the first things he did, he said, we're gonna stop doing 26 things and we're gonna make four devices. Two computers for business, one laptop, one desktop, two computers for, for personal use, one laptop, one desktop. That's what we're gonna do, and we're gonna be really, really good at it. So we've been trying to have the discipline to be focused. We spent a whole year on rolling out the reading curriculum, a whole year on the math curriculum, a whole year on the writing curriculum, just to get better at, as adults of understanding the demands of that curriculum. Uh, we also have tons of new ideas uh, that, that come out of the DCPS family uh, but it, it really, uh, when the rubber meets the road, it's about thoughtful implementation and execution. So lining up, number two, making sure our structures, supports, and resources are lined up to support that focus. That actually means moving money, people, and time to focus on those things. It means having math coaches and math support when you roll out the math curriculum. Um, we also think about alignment in the student experience. We are fortunate in D.C. that we have about 92% of our three and four-year-olds in full-time programming. So we were in alignment between age three through the 12th grade. And that's been a key driver. And then finally, and most important and tricky, is the, the quality bar. Uh, the quality was really important to us. And we, we, of course, needed high-quality materials. We owe that to teachers, and, and teachers owe that to their peers who are working on curriculum. But we wanted to do it in a way where we could create a floor, but not a ceiling, of what can happen in the classroom. Randy Weingarten once said to me, um, you know, we need to ensure that, as I mentioned before, our curriculum is not a straitjacket, right? It is a tool that teachers deserve, but they need to be able to do extraordinary things with it. Early on this work, I was uh, meeting with a bunch of folks to think about curriculum strategy, and Katie Haycock at the Education Trust said, you have to make sure your curriculum, you have to have one. You, you owe it to the district to, to assemble ninth grade math or third grade reading, but you must allow your teachers to elegantly adapt that curriculum to meet their students' needs who are in front of them every day and meet their own style as a teacher. So elegant adaptation has been a key component of all of our curriculum work when it's implemented in the classroom. 
I want to talk about four levers in just the teaching and learning world. The first one is curriculum, which we're going to spend most of the time about today. But curriculum is highly intera interactive with three others. Professional learning, of course. The professional learning of teachers, the meta curricula over the student facing experience um, is, is tremendously important. Formative assessment, we work, uh, we see that as a key lever of change and of course should be aligned to the curricula. And finally, mindset. And if you do these other things well and you have an explicit focus on mindset, you can change not only beliefs but actions for, for the expectations around what students are able to do. Um, at this point, we would usually pause in a workshop version and we would break and have a discussion a little bit about how you would define curricula. And I think if I asked our three panelists or I asked any random three people in the room, everybody would have a slightly different definition of what a curricula is or curriculum is. I actually think that's something that the education world needs to push on a little bit to have a, a more common understanding of the, the vocabulary. It muddies the water when you think curricula are just the state standards, but I think it's an adopted basal program. Or you think it's a resource you, you Google, and I think it's units of study. And without that shared knowledge, either at the teacher or grade level or the school level or the system level, it's very hard to have intelligent conversations about where your curriculum strategy should go. So however you're working in this world, I encourage you to get precise around your language. Um, and there's, I know of at least seven different meanings of the word curricula um, that we've tried to put out and, and discuss. For the sake of this conversation, we'll say curriculum is anything that helps the teacher know what to teach, when to teach it, and how to teach it. Okay, what to teach, when to teach, how to teach. That's where we're going for this one. This is where you're going to kind of um, allow me some latitude to kind of show you a tool that we've used in DC public schools to further the conversation of what curriculum should or shouldn't be. And it's a, a false dichotomy I've kind of put on a line from one to eight about how we have conversations around what we should do next for curricular support. All the way on the left is an approach for curriculum where you train in the process of backwards design, like understanding by design. This is where your teachers are given the standards and you unwrap them, unwind them, unpack them. You can do lots of unthings to standards apparently. You circle the verbs and underline the nouns. I'm seeing some nods like some of you have been in this world before. You find the power standards, you sort them, you put them into groups, you then make an assessment, then you backwards plan. And then maybe you know, Sunday night before you teach, you actually figure out what you're going to actually teach. So you've got a really elegant understanding of the, the standards and you, you've gone deep into them, right? Mm -hmm. That's trained in the process, that's curricular design uh, uh, number one. Number two, a district or a school could put in place benchmark assessments. Many of you probably live in this world, right? I'm going to test you at the beginning, the middle, and the end. At the big, big beginning, you're gonna, your third graders are going to see all the third grade math standards. They're not going to do very well because you haven't taught multiplication yet but it shows you progress towards grade level proficiency growth. One step further from that would be, and I pressed a button I didn't think I was supposed to. This is the eject button. Then. <laughs> One step beyond that would be paste interim assessments. Paste interim assessments are when you take, the, take a scope and sequence and you say, all right, these five math standards, then these five math standards, then these five math standards, it will actually pace out the year. There's lots of systems, a lot of charter schools and districts that have that sort of curriculum management system. It will be clear on the mileposts, but will allow teachers lots of leeway in how they get to that, that uh, learning. One more step beyond that might be in those units of, of time between the interims, we're actually going to put themes. Like you have to do, you know, plants during this topic here, and you have to do uh, space during this topic here, and you have to do roll doll books during this topic here. There's a thematic guidance uh, across the units of study. One step further might be within those units are exemplary ta tasks, anchor assignments, lessons, you know, like the exemplars. Beyond that, you might be offered as a teacher a full lesson bank. You know, as a district, we might buy, borrow, steal, or build 
all this series of lessons. And then one more step, you could actually take those lessons and put them on a calendar. This is the like, the dreaded or loved pacing guide approach to curriculum design. Kind of keeps you paced out day to day, week to week, what's going on. And then last, the penultimum, is the 180 days of scripted lessons. I'll be honest, I think in Alum Rock School District where I taught in 2003, we were essentially at an eight. I taught open court reading, Saxon math, which was amazing because it's scripted for the teacher and the student. Like, I don't know how they do that. It's just brilliant, brilliantly done. I, I taught step up to writing. I taught FOSS science and I taught Peace Builder social emotional program. It was pretty awesome as a first year teacher because it was like, tomorrow, here we go. Uh, by the second year, I got a little bored. By the third year, I moved to Oakland and um, moved on from there. Uh, what we usually do here is we try to illustrate some of the trade-offs for a district or a school to be at one versus to be at eight. And Cora, I don't know if you want to talk through a little bit of the strengths of one and two versus the strengths of seven and eight. Sure, I'm, I'm sure many of you are thinking maybe of where you are or where you were when you were teaching, um, kind of what experience you had, but I think that there are pros and cons to each uh, end of this continuum. So um, on the one and two, which is where I lived during my teaching career, um, working in charter schools initially, I kind of loved that ability to be able to design and create what I wanted to do. Um, it, it really allowed for teacher creativity. Um, and for me to be responsive to the needs of the students that were sitting in front of me. Um, however, the downside of that may have been the high level of burnout that my colleagues and I were noticing around us because we were trying to create curriculum from scratch at the same time as we were trying to, you know, be in touch with our families and connect with, um, you know, students' needs in other areas, and it, it becomes very overwhelming. On the, on the seven to eight end, um, of course, as Brian suggested in his first year teaching, having that there for you can be hugely, hugely helpful for new teachers. Um, when you start thinking about district-wide, my whole thinking about where this continuum changes a lot because when you start thinking about students moving around your district and maybe moving a lot, we have a high level of mobility in DC public schools. So if one teacher is teaching something completely different in third grade than another teacher, that becomes problematic. So the, the more predictable curriculum that you find with seven and eight can be really a powerful um, experience for um, students and making sure that we can kind of guarantee that they will be learning certain things. So there's, um, the downside to that of course can be feeling like you're in a, a straitjacket, as Brian said, and not having the ability to use your creative talents and develop the curriculum you, the way you want. So there is probably no perfect place um, and when you find yourself responsible for developing a cr curriculum strategy for an entire district, it becomes um, a little more difficult to figure out where on this line you want to land. <coughs> yeah. Three comments on this, and as, as you have questions, drop them down. We'll save time at the end for, for specific questions. We're happy to go back to various slides. Three, three uh, takeaways from this one. First is I think schools, charter systems, and districts need to do a better job of having this conversation. I think there's often a point of view somewhere, but it's not very transparent. And it's certainly not very transparent to teachers in the system, like where are we and why are we there? Why am I developing all this stuff for myself? Well, maybe that's because either there's no resources for further purchasing of other stuff, or there's a belief that you best know what you're going to teach when you get your hands dirty and design the instruction. Maybe you're over at seven and, it, and you're saying, oh, I feel like I don't really, you know, I don't have much creativity here, but it's more around in certain areas, the district, the school, the system wanted to be, ensure more equity of experience for the student. Right? And mobility was a really key factor. I don't think systems are transparent enough or having the conversations about why a curriculum strategy is what it is. Number two, there is an important decision a, a, a district or system or a school has to make. It is what is going to be available for teachers. And you can kind of go down the line, right? And you might say, we're going to make lessons on a calendar available for teachers. If, you've ne if I, I have never taught ninth grade algebra before, I would probably want lessons on a calendar. I might actually want scripted lessons that I could study the night before and go teach, because I have never taught algebra one before. 
right? So that might be available, and that's a resource question as well. How much money, time, people, resources do you have to make that available across how many subjects and how many classes? The other question districts have to think about is what is required of any given teacher? And those two numbers can be different. You could have seven available for teachers, but you could only require the PACE interim assessments. And being very transparent about what is available and what is required. In DC public schools, when I first got there, we were essentially a one and two district. We have something called the BAS, benchmark assessments, and we trained in process. We moved to a three, we then moved to a four, and we just this year moved to a five as being required. And we had lots of conversations with the school leaders, coaches, principals about where we should be and why at any given time, particularly with our focus on having amazing teachers and highly effective educators. Right? You have to kind of, what tools and where should the requirement be? Now, that whole time, we've always been wanting to make available for teachers all the way to a seven. Now, that takes a lot of work, a lot of time, or a lot of money. It's kind of a trade-off of those three. We are trying to get to make sure, no matter what you teach in DC, you have uh, tools and resources at like a seven, more or less. But only up to a five at this point is required. Um, and that might change based on how students are doing, teacher feedback, resource allocation, but that is where we're at right now, and I think everybody, all the teachers know, depending on what subject they are, where they're at. All right, so that was kind of phase one. We are at a, a five required. We have units of study. They have aligned interims. It's kind of, that's our curricular package, and in many, many classes and courses, we have offered at least a lesson bank and even a lessons that are on a calendar so that in ninth grade English, this is kind of our best shot at pacing that out for you. But it's not required of teachers to use that. I'm going to go into kind of the second phase now and describe to you a little more concretely what the stuff of our curricula looks like. We often, in a backwards design model, have a unit assessment. Those have then drive the scope and sequence document across the year of study. And the unit of study is very important for us. They're the units of study of kind of collected topics, themes, um, across all subject areas across the year. And within those, we then fill the units of study with specific resources that are content, um, you know, driven by the content. The units of study run across the scope and sequence, and there's not a set number per grade, per subject. We let the content drive that. So in, in ninth grade English, there are four units of study, but in third grade math, there might be nine units of study because the, the, the content drives how many units there are. And we put the lessons in. And all of these were developed, these materials were developed either by buying something off the shelf and elegantly adapting it or developing it in-house with our own teachers. And Ashley Bessex was on a, uh, the beginning years of our Common Core Reading Core who did some of the dirty work of creating some of these tools. They created scope and sequence documents across all grades for English language arts, which include these new units of study that were content-based, uh, with, filled with great literature and great informational text. They created the unit overviews and a backwards design model of kind of the essential questions, the enduring understandings, the culminating task, and the readings. And they made close reading modules and novel guides that allow teachers to kind of say, all right, I'm gonna teach this close reading or this novel, kind of what are the, the questions I might ask, what are the academic vocabulary words, how do I engage my, my kids in discussion? So I wanna ask Ashley, when she thinks back to that time, um, what was it like to kind of set your summer aside, dig into the, what I call the dirty grueling, and she calls the fun, and that's why she's here, the fun work of kind of curriculum design at that unit level? We started for about five weeks or so um, talking with our colleagues about um, which novels would be best for our students. Um, we got an opportunity to read the novel and to think about what would the experience be like for our students. And uh, the great thing is, is that as we started talking through, we couldn't stop talking about the novels and what they may mean for our students, what they mean um, to them as far as looking at the world differently. Um, any connections that we can make with um, current events. And 
From there, we took those novels and we decided to develop some questioning centered on the novels. We tried to figure out what the author's purpose and how we can develop the questions to help students to understand um, writer's intent and um, how literature is developed. And it was a great opportunity to not only read it as a teacher, but also more importantly, focus on what would this be like for our students? Great. Um, <clears throat> when you think about not only doing the work, but also the professional learning that came out of that, uh, how did that impact your, your teaching the next year as you go and do that work? Yeah, well, I had an opportunity to work with instructional coaches and um, some other colleagues from central office, and that gave me an opportunity to think of different perspectives. We all come from different backgrounds and different schools, and we teach different kids in different grade levels, so it was a great opportunity for us to talk through uh, what would this look like for a struggling reader? What would this look like for a student who was advanced? Um, what would we want this student to be able to, to do and to know for next school year? And I think those were the very candid but useful conversations that we had centered on um, students and, and how we developed the novel guides really was based on our experience in the classrooms with our previous students. Great, and would you say that this was a, a better route? There are novel guides likely available that you can purchase off the shelf, right. go and teach. How did this differ then from, from that strategy of curriculum development procurement? It was a great investment tool for me. I, I loved creating the novel guides because I, I owned it. I was able to live and breathe the novel um, like I wanted my students to. Uh, so professionally, it helped me to grow in knowing different levels of study for my students, from the basic level of just understanding what the text is about to a higher performing level to understanding the nuances of reading, the nuances of um, learning about literature. Um, so I think that would probably be the most important part of developing the curriculum. Thanks. Yeah, when I used to visit those rooms, uh, you get a sense of folks just nerding out on the content that they're excited to teach. And that is a great feeling. Um, and, and to allow the professional time and space to do that work, I think, is tremendously impactful. Um, and it pays off for, for Ashley's students. I've been in her classroom, and she makes those novels come alive because she knows those novels so well. Um, we'll return to Ashley about her teaching experience around some of her curriculum in a bit. But first, I want to take uh, kind of oh, some liberty to talk about our, our DCPS ELA units. For those of you who are working in the Common Core or College and Career Readiness state standards that look like the Common Core um, world, you will know that the, the standards do not have the content in them on the ELA side. Somebody, either the teacher, the school, the district, the state, needs to put what are the units going to be? What are you going to read about? And we argue very strongly that there should be coherence around the topics that students learn across grade and within grade. So that you're learning a, a, a breadth and depth of topics. Those topics should be driven from science and social studies where possible. We used our DCPS science and social studies standards to make the DSPS units of study. They make them very content rich when you do that. They are topics like, as I mentioned before, space and plants. Our third graders learn about Washington, D.C., and then they learn about democracy. They're learning about things that are, that are meaningful to them in the world. I also believe this is important because we have a duty to systematically and explicitly build content knowledge. Reading is, hingent, is contingent upon phonemic awareness and phonics and vocabulary, but it, it has a big piece once you get into the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade and beyond on bringing your own content knowledge. And if we're gonna spend 120 minutes in a literacy block at the elementary grades, let's read about the world ab around us that's worthy, meaningful, and authentic. We've done very, a lot of work in, in, our, in our units to, to make that happen. Um, and we will continue to kind of strengthen that work. I will also say it makes ELA literacy instruction much more fun and interesting. 
the kids like in second grade, I teach one week a year, and uh, I've often taught during the weather unit, Students like learning about wild weather and kind of they write their own reports about weather that they pick. It is interesting intellectually to the students and you have a duty to kind of shape that experience for them. So I do want to take a look at some of our anchor novels that fall within our, our 6th through 12th grades. Um, boy, we, uh, you could fight for days, right? And we have and we, we will continue over what should be in the units. I want to be clear that these are not all required. They are all on that seven on that line. Only when they're associated with a shared required exemplar task are they required. And you'll see, you know, first unit of sixth grade is growing up, so we have Tuck Everlasting in that unit um, as, as an anchor novel, and that's the work that Ashley and the team does to build out and shape and, and, and discuss. We also worked with the National Organization Teaching Tolerance out of the Southern Poverty Law Center. They have a booth here today. Um, and with a local uh, organization called Teaching for Change, which is out of, uh, runs a bookstore out of Busboys and Poets, we worked with them on, on an audit for culturally relevant texts and literature across difference, author, character, um, topic, backgrounds, to make sure that we had a very, a, a variety of texts as anchors. Again, there's also short pieces of text in each of the units, so this is not the only thing that students are reading. We'll often pair it with shorter text and make sure that that text is also equally uh, reflective across difference. So our sixth grade, this is our seventh grade. Some of our seventh grade anchor novels. I go back and forth on boy. I don't know if anyone's read it. Some of it goes over my head, so it's certainly, I think, going over seventh graders' heads, but it's a fun book and a fun story um, in that one. Our eighth grade novels. Again, here you'll see socialism and science, uh, socialism in a bunch. You know, the first unit is around the American Revolution. It's also in the American Revolution in social studies, so we have Chains as the anchor novel there. Um, we also look for books that have sequels. So Chains has Forge as the second one. So trying to get kids book hooked during the, the reading in class and then carry that on in their uh, free time. These are our ninth grade anchor novels. You can reflect all the conversations around text complexity. Obviously there's some texts up here that have lots of qualitative complexity as well as quantitative complexity. These are our 10th grade novels. I'm actually going to pause here because this is one of Ashley's grades. Um, and she's worked on, on all these books over the course of her time here. Um, and I wanted to see if you wanted to share about your experience actually teaching any of these. What works well? What's been a challenge? So teaching the, the novels are, you know, one of the highlights of my career when I'm teaching students. Um, now we're in my 10th grade class, we're reading Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried. It's a wonderful novel, it's a war book, and so many students are just engaged in the conversation about war. They're um, excited to have conversations about um, the art of storytelling, which is the focus of the novel. And the biggest thing that I, I like to take away from it is that it engages students in a, a academic conversation about literature but also we have many authentic conversations about the world. And our students are so excited to talk about these novels. Um, when they come to school each day, they can predict, well, what are we doing today? And they know that we're going to pull out the novels. They know that we're going to have rich conversations. They know that they're gonna be asked to write every day. They're, they know that their brains are going to be stretched every day. And that's the joy in coming to the classroom um, with our units of study and knowing that our students are excited to, to join us in that unit of study. Um, one of the biggest challenges would be that we know that our world is evolving and we know that our students, sometimes they want more. They want to be um, exposed to different kinds of texts every day. And that's where we pull in some of our extended activities. I know specifically for the unit with Tim O'Brien, the things they carried, we included historical context. We included um, some talks about um, war veterans. We 
included some talks about um, current events so that our students are not just studying the novel, but they're also studying what is it like to be in war. And they're studying things that are going on around the world. Great. Thank you. Uh, this is our 11th grade anchor novels. The last is a collection of stories. And our 12th grade anchor novels. Corey, I don't know if you have anything to add on the, the anchor novel work or the pairing with short texts and kind of an example or two of those. Sure. I think um, choosing the anchor novels is probably the hardest thing we had to do. And um, because as, y as you probably know, if any of you are, were, or were an English teacher or know an English teacher, people get attached to the literature that they teach in the classroom. So this was um, one of the hardest things I think for me to have to lead as a district leader um, is just put a stake in the ground and say these are going to be the novels. And of course, there are millions of other amazing books that we could be reading. Um, but I think it was important for a number of reasons to kind of just make a decision. One is, as I talked about before, the student mobility. The other thing is, when we before we had these novels in place, we sometimes saw the same novel being taught year after year. <laughs> and so the student was experiencing, I don't know what was one of the common ones, um, they're experiencing Romeo and Juliet three times in their high school career. Like that should not happen. As a district, we cannot allow that to happen. And so um, it also sometimes pushed teachers really far outside of their comfort zone, um, which is, I think a good thing. I mean, that led to a lot of difficult conversations, but there's some of, we try to have, a, as you saw, a diverse uh, set of novels, and some people don't love teaching maybe Shakespeare. They don't love teaching um, The Grapes of Wrath. But I think that pushing those teachers to try something new and experience it with their colleagues together, so we the opportunity through professional development to have teachers who are teaching these novels come together, discuss it together, um, really helps to keep our teaching force kind of always learning. Um, so I imagine we will always be kind of changing and recycling these novels over time. Um, we're also trying to get to the point where we build in a little bit more choice. So maybe for each unit, there might be two or three novels that we have built out, um, really great cur uh, curricular resources around. And so teachers can choose, uh, you know, which one they want to do at this, this year with this set of students. Um, so... Thanks. I do want to move on and give you just a few snapshots of some of the work we've done across other curricular areas. First is uh, we put in place a district-wide explicit systematic phonics program. We chose Wilson Fund Foundations. I don't really care, you know, I'm kind of agnostic of what it, what one it is, but I know that first grade teachers, they don't need to invent phonics instruction every Sunday night, what they're gonna teach that week. Like we know how to teach the 44 sounds of the English language, and we know that systematic explicit phonics and phonemic awareness instruction is important. So kind of getting that out of the way. Um, also building vocabulary and keeping the, the phonological, awareness, uh, phonological studies alive throughout the elementary grades, so foundational reading. In DC public schools, we also have done an investment in small group literacy instruction. You'll see here, this is junior grade books in the lower right. Um, we purchased for schools a, a guided reading level book library. We, hand, we didn't just buy it off the shelf, we hand selected every title, six books of each title that's in every single school and teachers use that at the guided reading table uh, right there while students are engaged in small group literacy. Um, and this is the Wilson setup. So, you know, lots of attention, time, money, resources on, on foundational reading and small group literacy, moving students up. Writing has been a, a little tricky for us, and I, I would admit that we have uh, a long way to go still on ensuring that we are providing rigorous, meaningful writing instruction to students, and that students are doing kind of the cognitive work of the writing. Uh, we adopted some curricular materials some time back. We've actually made a switch. We used to have writing as a separate portion of the elementary block. It was like, read about the, the unit of study, go to small group literary instruction, then writing. We've taken writing and put it right into those units of study. So students are reading, writing, speaking, listening about that content area. Coming out of the, the Virginia Writing Collaborative, we think students, they need to have something to write about and something to say about it. So we, we tie that together. These are my second graders at Tubman Elementary School. I was there the week they were finishing their weather reports. This was their publishing party. Um, and they were writing the reports in the model of Gail Gibbons' books. So they were studying Gail Gibbons, who has a certain style to her books. And then they were studying their own self-selected uh, topic in weather 
they all choose things like hailstorms and really violent things like that. Nobody was like, rain, let me tell you about the water cycle. Not gonna happen. Um, we also have focused on math through inquiry. These uh, pictures I took from grades K through three, but it goes all the way up through um, the upper grade math. Um, we, you will see lots of students doing open-ended questions and problems, um, the, the work of the grade of the Common Core, and using manipulatives and, and kind of showing conceptually their learning. We also have the most blended learning uh, online computer programs tied to our math curriculum. So that's another place where students are getting differentiated, personalized instruction along the math scope and sequence. In DCPS, we have a big focus on science and social studies. These bulletin boards are actually from our ELA class units. This is a solar system unit that's in the fifth grade. Uh, our fourth grade is moving to fifth grade because the next generation of science standards move it up there. And this is Eureka. It's a fifth grade unit around the science of discovery. Uh, that's a great unit where students are reading about inventions. The fifth graders love the reading about the, the invention of the toilet. Who knew? Um, and then they study all those. They watch things like the Shark Tank video of a seven-year-old girl presenting Boo Boo Gone. They learn what a patent is and investments. And then they actually present. They come up with their own invention as part of a shared required uh, district-wide assignment. And they present their own uh, uh, invention to a panel. Um, and finally, we are very fortunate in D.C. that we have invested from age three all the way through elementary, middle, and high in arts, that's music and, and art, global education, health, PE. Global education includes world language, where all of our students as early as age three are studying a, a world language. Uh, Spanish is our, our largest offering there. Um, so all of these subject areas here um, also have units of study and resources associated with them. And we are at various points on that line to see you know, how many lessons, how many resources can we offer. If you are an anatomy physiology teacher, an elective in our high school, you are not all the way out to a seven. We don't have that co course covered yet. You're doing a lot of the one and two work still in that course. But if you're a biology teacher, a, a required course for ninth graders, we are further towards that seven. So we've made some decisions about resource allocation um, accordingly. We're trying hard to, to flesh that out system-wide across all of these subject areas. I'm going to go to the panel and see if they have anything else to add on, on the middle topic, which is DCPS-wide kind of adoption of uh, units of study and curriculum. Specifically, I'd love to hear from Ashley or Terry, who's going to speak about our last topic. Um, do you feel like this is penetrated? Do you feel like um, teacher, the, the, it's in use? I will note that when we began, as I mentioned, we were at a three not requiring the units of study. Um, and we, we surveyed teachers, and 83% of them reported they were using the, the units of study. So the idea was, if you build it and it's good, they will come. I called it the field of dreams curriculum strategy for DC public schools. <laughs> now, do you find that, that this stuff is in use, and is it a, is it why, why or why not? Absolutely. I, I think that a lot of the teachers just appreciate that other colleagues and um, instructional coaches came together to produce quality uh, units of study for our students. I know that my colleagues especially um, enjoy the novels that were selected. Um, and they look forward to each unit of study because they know exactly what's going to be taught, and then they have the opportunity to um, change it for the sake of their students. They know their students' strengths, and they know how to uh, foster those strengths through the units of study that were built because of the question <coughs> banks and because of the extended activities. Um, they have that at their own disposal to use for, for the greater good of our students. Excellent. Elegant adaptation in practice. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, I want to move to, to our final topic today, which is, so we did all of this work around units of study, resources that go into them, uh, the scope and sequence, trying to create a floor and not a ceiling, elegantly adapt, you know, all that work. And it still was clear, and this is to be perfectly frank, that there was too much variation between classroom to classroom, school to school, of the academic stuff that students were engaged in in the classroom.
right? You would go into one classroom and it would be low level worksheets falling in the weather unit that was not actually good content or make, you know, helping kids do the cognitive work of learning. And you go into the other classroom and they are like pouring through complex text in an interactive discussion with kids producing student work. And the, the, just because you were teaching the weather unit did not actually mean your students were experiencing the type of teaching and learning that allowed for their academic growth. So the chancellor said to all of us, how do we, in this city, of, to of, of real difference in inequity, how do we shine a spotlight and what levers do you have to pull across all the offices, not just teaching and learning, but all the offices, to begin to tackle issues of equity, right? So we're not talking about equality, but, but equity and access to rigorous academic content. And what we decided here was for the academic world, at the center of the interaction between a teacher, student, and the content, is the task students are engaged in. And how that manifests itself from the teacher, it's the assignment that is put for in, front of, in front of students. So we decided to go straight to the heart of that triangle and do some real meaningful, poignant work around shared assignments falling within the units of study. At this point, we have these shared assignments. We have 240 lesson experiences that run between two and 30, maybe 20 days, depending on, on, the, on the unit of study. Most of them are short, about a week long or so. They are in reading, math, science, social studies, art, music, health, P, and world language, and they run from grades K through 12. When folks ask me, oh, you're doing these what we call cornerstone experiences, where, wh where did you start? Where did you pilot? What did you start with? You did ELA first, right? Grades two through five. No. We wanted to make sure that this, this was a tool for all subject area teachers at all grade levels. And that's how we went to scale on it. Um, these, these assignments, which were developed by DCPS teachers in partnership with LearnZillion to create our own dream team here in DC, these are DCPS teachers who committed their summer to working on, within the units of study, either creating, borrowing, buying, adapting, or stealing amazing curricular experiences and putting them into our units of study. They are now shared across the district, so if you are a second grader, you, you all learn how to ride a bike in second grade in DC public schools in your PE class. It is a second grade cornerstone. In chemistry, you learn how to make a battery. It is a shared experience. And this is important for a couple reasons. One, it illustrates what we, what kind of collectively as a DCPS family, what does rigor, engagement, relevance, and authenticity look like when it comes to content across grades and subjects? Number two, often these, these assignments or these tasks use uh, what we call a high impact instructional model or method. And finally, they all require a student work product, either a presentation, a written, oral, some sort of engagement around, and, and production, creation of, of your own thing as a student. Corey, do you want to talk a little bit more about the instructional model? Because um, I think that's a kind of a key piece for professional development and scale. Sure. Um, when we first started creating our curriculum, we always saw curriculum as intimately tied to professional development and that we could actually help change teachers' instructional practice through what we baked right into our curriculum. So the, the instructional moves that we wanted teachers to make, we would try to bake right into the curriculum. And I, felt, I feel that with Cornerstones, um, with this initiative, we took it even one step further. So because Cornerstones are now required tasks across the district, we decided that every cornerstone would have embedded in it at least one high impact instructional model that that content area was trying to push across the entire district. So for example, for English language arts, um, the and high impact instructional model might be close reading, right? So ensuring that, thank you, <laughs> ensuring that um, teachers are analyzing text closely with students or allowing students to analyze text closely um, and we have a whole process for that. So we, there, that is one part of the cornerstones. Another thing that we wanted 
to have in place across social studies classrooms, ELA classrooms, was rich academic discussion. And so a Paideia seminar was another example of an instructional model that is baked right into some of the cornerstones. Um, Project-based learning is really evident in, our, in many of our elementary um, cornerstones. And um, the 5E instructional model, which is an inquiry approach to math, is evident in a lot of our uh, math and science cornerstones. So we use this really as a lever to teach teachers about um, really effective ways to teach their particular content. Great. I'd love to turn over to, to Terry now. She is in, in the art classroom and has been for some time. So she's kind of seen the before and the after, and she's living right now Cornerstones. And I think you just finished Cornerstones 1, 2. Yes. And we're getting ready to do professional development next Friday on Cornerstone 3, which so the model goes professional development in, in cohorts of like teachers, second grade teachers, art teachers, biology teachers. They do the PD around the task that's coming up. They then do that task in the next 35 days, and then they come back, bring student work, bring reflection. So how's it going so far? It's going great. Cornerstones one and two are completed. Uh, we are working on cornerstone three right now. And after the PD, getting ready to move into uh, cornerstone four. Right. Uh, but the best thing about cornerstones for me is that they are so easily adapted and uh, able to be extended and customized, if you will, into the learning experience in the classroom. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what the cornerstone involves. So for fourth grade, which was our first cornerstone, the theme was becoming. But in becoming, the task was to introduce close viewing. So in close viewing, uh, I decided to select the work, uh, Christina's World by Andrew Wyatt, where the students would look at this work and uh, see Christina, the character in the work of art, becoming. She was disabled, she had polio, but yet she refused to allow herself to uh, be cuddled or to even uh, use uh, the support of a wheelchair. So this work, we also compared it to Frida Kahlo, who was also debilitated, and also uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who also had a debilitation and was not uh, afraid to become or to become the president or to become someone great. So this, in this close viewing, the students had a chance to uh, actually view, analyze, uh, reflect, and make connections with their own life. Um, in close viewing, uh, it became a routine pattern of behavior in my classroom. So it was, it, should, it was suggested that it would be just one lesson in this particular cornerstone. Some cornerstones last from six to 10 sessions, but in this particular one, close viewing, it was suggested to be just one. Uh, however, I saw this as an opportunity to teach my children how to think and uh, how to observe, how to look at a work of art, how to look at an object and uh, analyze it, uh, just really see use deep thinking uh, and, and see how it can be used in other curriculum areas too. I'm sure you've heard of uh, the thinking routine, I see, I think, I wonder, uh, which came from Harvard's Project Zero. So uh, we use that thinking routine as a part of close viewing. But um, my school has a large ELL population. And I knew that they would not be able to, uh, they wouldn't want to write what I see, what I think, what I wonder. So what I did was I changed things around and I said, I'm going to put what I see, I think, I wonder on the board. And uh, I told them, I said, everything that you say is very important to me, so I'm going to write it down. Well, before when I, you know, no one would raise their hand to make comment. 
when I put all of these thinkings on the board, the viewings, the thinking, the wonderings, then everybody wanted to contribute because after I put it on the board, I read each one verbatim what they had said and they were, the children were so surprised. They said, oh, she really thinks that what I have to say is important. So after that, everybody wanted to speak. Everybody wanted to contribute. So from that point on, that was the jumping off point for us to use works like that for close viewing. So the close viewing became a routine in my classroom. Every week when they would come, then we would start with the close viewing exercise. But this was all a part of the cornerstone opportunity. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, so like Corey spoke about close reading as a routine that, that happens once in the cornerstone, but that can live throughout the curriculum. Close viewing in the art classroom is something that was built in the cornerstone, but now lives throughout the curriculum. Uh, and teachers have deeper experience because they went through the professional development around that, that close viewing. Um, before we, we wrap uh, for, for some questions and final comments from, from the panelists, I, I want to kind of give three ideas for the room on what you might do coming out of this session as you return to your jobs, or whatever they might be. First is if you're working in a system or, or, or a school, autonomous school, a charter school, or a district, you might think about doing some sort of replication of the process we've gone through building definitions of curriculum and the power and potential of that curriculum in, uh, to, to ignite student learning. Think through where on that line you and your colleagues want to be uh, given what you know about your system and, and your students and your teachers and articulate that clearly and make it transparent. And, and third then is doing the work of pulling teachers together, building, borrowing, you know, putting together coherently uh, a rich, engaging curriculum across subject areas. Number two is I really encourage you to think about the lever of professional development around content pe pedagogy around these high-impact instructional models, right? What are the models that bring high-quality content and allow students to engage cognitively in that to produce student work? And think about that being the topic of your PD. Choose something like close viewing and pick a, allow teachers to pick a, a topic and come to the professional development and learn about the teacher moves to make that happen and close the loop then by having the next one have them come back, bring student work, or, or reflect on it. So, you know, of all the stuff we've done, I think the most powerful has been when we focused on instructional tasks that are going to be in front of students. And then finally, our materials are going to be available from the unit, uh, from the scope and sequence to the unit, to the resource, to all of the 204 cornerstones, uh, starting I in late summer and then running through next school year, we'll be uploading them. So watch the DSPS website for the launch of a new sharing site. We want to make these tools open educational resources that can be elegantly adapted, not just in DC, but across the nation uh, as tools for engaging students in high quality content. So keep your eye on announcements around these materials being open for all of you. And we'll want the feedback back so that these things can just constantly get, be getting refined and better and better. So I do want to open up for the panelists if they have any final, final comments or thoughts around the power and potential of curriculum. And then we'll go to folks' questions. I was just going to say I feel that the, the potential of curriculum and having worked on this really deeply for um, about five years now, I'm constantly amazed at how much I'm learning and realizing about how much power and potential there is in curriculum. So it's for the students, like how can you create something that is so amazing and, and um, powerful for students, changes their lives, opens uh, new ideas to them, but also for teachers, um, for teachers' professional learning and to help them shift and change their practice and think about it in new ways, but also building teachers as leaders, like you saw with Ashley, her coming together to work with her colleagues to develop a curriculum for the rest of the district was a really powerful leadership opportunity for her. And that feedback back and forth between district leadership and teachers around the curriculum just, I think, has made our district a much better place um, to work for both me and hopefully for the teachers as well. Great. Ashley or Terry, any final thoughts? I disagree with what Corey was saying about um, it being a great professional opportunity for teachers. I think my teaching has definitely um, have changed um, in a 
in a great way because of the opportunities that I've had to work on the units of study. And I see myself um, growing every day in front of my students. Um, they realize that I wrote a lot of the lessons that I'm teaching. Um, and although it has the DCPS logo, you know, I can speak authentically about the units of study because I, I wrote most of the units of study for, for my grade level. Um, so that's a great opportunity to not only um, pass on from, you know, teacher to teacher, but also from teacher to student. They realize that my teacher has invested in my learning so much that they created this novel guide or this unit of study for me to be able to engage in the content in a very different way than I have before. With the Cornerstones, we want our students to feel successful. Let them know they can be successful in every learning experience. Um, and that, uh, especially in terms of the Cornerstone, that this is a memorable experience for them. One that years from now, they'll think back and they'll say, boy, you know, when I was in the uh, second grade, we made a uh, habitat or we did something really really special but lessons that will stay with them for the rest of their lives great super I want to um, open up now for any questions from folks I think there's uh, one coming great thank you um, is this on yeah yes. all right my name is Dave thanks Move. for the presentation you mentioned cornerstones as an initiative initiative designed with equity in mind for some consistency of the student experience and I guess after listening to the presentation, one assumption I had is that you decided that the assessment of those would be left up for some teacher autonomy. Um, and I just wondered if there was a conversation about that, and if so, why you d made the choice for teacher autonomy on how they would assess it, knowing that um, that does affect maybe the student experience and how challenging an assignment is, but that it's also very difficult to standardized assessment of a project. Yeah, you're talking about um, what is our, our approach on assessing the student product that comes out of uh, the shared assignments? That's great. I'll let the folks share a little bit, but all of the, most of these things are products that need, that, that need to be assessed on a rubric. So there are often shared rubrics now built into the cornerstone that are cornerstone specific. There are some things that carry over, like an ELA, the park rubric is the foundational rubric for, for many of those assignments. I'll be honest, I think it's year two and year three of the work around student work, annotating that work, norming around it, and having those conversations around, around the assessment uh, is where, we're, where we want to go. You know, folks have ideas on, on the ass yeah, assessing. I mean, it was a really tricky um, place because we didn't, we, I mean, I think you have to go a little bit slowly in order to do this well. And so now, as we're going through our first year of this, we are collecting student work samples, and our goal is to have an annotated um, sort of bank of student work at the varying levels of the rubrics, so that going into year two and year three, teachers can have a better understanding of what should this student product actually look like when it's done to excellence. And I would say the other piece of it that I think is really, really powerful, but you cannot rush, is Teachers come together on the professional development days after they've taught a cornerstone. I think Terry alluded to that. And then they, um, they actually bring work samples with them. And they have to sit there with their colleagues and show their work samples and discuss them. And there's a lot of great conversation that happens there when you see another colleague bringing something that maybe is looking a lot better than what your students produced. And then you want to think, you know, you have those conversations about how did you get your students to be so successful with that? What did you do? How did you support them? How did you scaffold this or that? And so those conversations are exactly the conversations we want teachers to be having so that they're really owning the raising of the bar. And we're not just sort of like coming down and saying it has to look like this, but it's, I think it has to happen coming from both directions. Great. Hi, um, my name's Nicole. I'm actually a teacher in a charter school in the district. Yes. Um, I did have a question. I, here in the district, we are really highly benefited from the fact that we have preschool starting off at three. And you did speak to the fact that we have common core alignment as far as down as uh, preschool three. I wanted to understand a little bit further about how the curriculum design may be included or where the curriculum design falls for. Is it more level one, two for your preschool programs or is it more in that four or five area? Because we saw a lot of curricular experiences starting in kindergarten, but I didn't really hear explicitly of how beyond maybe PE and specials that it was in incorporated into preschool um, three mm. and four. 
Yes, so I, I believe the question is, um, one, what do we have for early childhood, and then also for upper level AP and then electives. So we're not there yet. Um, uh, how, we do have adopted curricular at, the ele at early childhood, so we have uh, four models that we use, tools of the mind being one, cr creative curriculum two, and then Emilio Reggio and Montessori. And uh, uh, the vast majority of our classrooms use one of those four early childhood curricular models. Uh, at the AP, we have a lot of work still to do on upper level math, uh, electives, AP courses. Uh, you know, this is one of those things around how much capacity, time, people, resources, money do you have and how quickly can you build out. So our plan is to go there, um, it's just we have not yet gotten to there. Hi, my name is Lizzie. Uh, it's really exciting to hear you talk about all the curriculum work that you've done, and it also sounds like you've done a lot of work around deciding like the instructional best practices that should be used in each content and doing a lot of work to align like the curricular uh, resources you're providing to those instructional best practices. So I'm curious to hear um, what was the process for deciding on and developing those instructional best practices, and did you decide on those beforehand, like before you went down the road of creating all the curriculum, or did you do it in tandem, and, and just overall, like what was that process? Yeah, um, so I'm gonna throw it, throw it to the panel because they're very specific to the content right. area, right? We didn't come in and say, like I didn't create them out of my head, I don't know what, what, what is the right thing in social studies. So Padea Seminar came out of the social studies teachers because they saw a need to increase the amount of meaningful academic discussions going on around historical documents, events, et cetera, and then Padea Seminar was the vehicle to reach that goal. So I don't know, Tara, if you know where close, close viewing came from mm -hmm. when you were all were first working on Cornerstone One. Like, why close viewing, do you think? Right. I think close viewing, first of all, was an excellent first choice. Uh, because it's something that can be transferred to all curriculums and across curricular areas. Uh, but we have to be able to teach our children how to think first and uh, help them to uh, pick things apart, analyze things, uh, talk about things, collaborate, learn how to listen to each other and so I think it was the perfect place to start. I'm not exactly sure where it came from and who decided that we would start with close viewing first. Um, but it was a good choice, good decision. Any of you have anything to add on that? Uh, there's power behind the models. They often come from the, either the standards and like what the spirit of the standards are. They're usually not listed in there. Or they come from, you know, Corey attending literacy networks mm -hmm. and learning from other places what is working, what's not in actual classrooms. Yeah. yeah, and I would just say we didn't, I think to the second part of your question, we didn't necessarily wait until we had everything figured out before we first started our no, building our curriculum not. because we were doing this when the Common Core had just come out and we were an early adopter of the Common Core. So it was very much an iterative process where we were learning and then we were like, oh, we just learned this new approach to argument writing. And so we went back and put it into our curriculum and then we would sh share that in PD. And then, so it was all kind of reinforcing each other, but there's a constant kind of revision going on. Um, but a lot of it was, going to learning opportunities and, and learning from other places or from experts, um, really trying to look at the research about how students learn best within a particular content area. Oh, and we fight about it too. Like, <laughs> there are serious arguments sometimes around what are our stakes should be in the ground when it comes to how much time in small group literacy instruction, how much time on grade level text, right? Like instructional text, grade level text. We are still mm -hmm. battling that, that question out. I and mean, that's gonna drive future adoption of instructional models. Next. Um, hi, my name is Brandon Springer. I teach uh, 11th grade US history in Dallas. Um, first, thank you for sharing what you guys are doing. It sounds really exciting, especially in um, reading and literacy. I'm really curious what you are doing uh, in designing social studies curriculum, yeah. um, especially when, with supporting reading and writing. Great question. Um, so fortunately, Corey is not just the deputy chief of literacy, but also humanities, which includes social <laughs> studies. So she'd be happy to tell you a little bit, particularly our work around, around the Literacy Design Collaborative, um, and we've built 
uh, scale, they're called, um, she'll tell you what they stand for, um, and bliss modules in science and social studies to bring together content and literacy skills into this learning experience. Yeah, I would just say being um, in charge of literacy and social studies is great because we have a very literacy rich approach to social studies. Um, and I'm lucky to have a great social studies team that believes very strongly in that. So as Brian mentioned, the Literacy Design Collaborative is just sort of a, a framework for creating curriculum that could exist in any content area, but we actually adopted that as our curriculum framework model for social studies within the UBD units of study. So. Um, these literacy design collaborative modules, they basically end in a culminating task where um, students create, uh, students read and uh, I guess experience a lot of different sources, like could be things like maps or charts and things like that, but usually a lot of text, primary and secondary sources that are all, that are building towards deep understanding of the content standards that they're learning and culminates in students creating something. Um, and so the LDC framework gives you templates for creating those curricular frameworks. Um, and so we, we had, teach, much like we had Ashley and other English teachers help us build the close reading modules, the units of study, and the novel guides, we pulled teachers together to help us build um, LDC modules, which we call bliss modules, building literacy in social studies. Um, so bliss modules um, for what they deemed as the most critical content for each course. So for world history, this is um, you know, a, a critical piece um, of content. We're gonna build a whole three week LDC module around it. And so teachers are, are using that. That's probably our, our richest curricular resource for social studies um, right now. And it, it in entirely bakes in a lot of reading and writing um, and then the Paideia seminar is the other sort of key instructional model that we're using in cornerstones for social studies. So we really want our social studies classrooms to be rich in debate and discussion. And lastly, the C3 framework, um, which if you're familiar with social studies is sort of like the common core type uh, standards approach to social studies that is also new. And um, a big component of that that we've really hooked onto is the, they ask students to take action with all of the content that they're learning. The like sort of last step is what is the piece of civic action that you could take around this type of content. And so we are trying to build those pieces of civic action into um, our cornerstones and into our curriculum. Great, and I recommend checking out the LDC library. Um, several of our bliss modules have reached exemplary status or in that library. Uh, most notably, one around three religions and Jerusalem as a pl uh, sense of place and three religions. Hi, I'm Katie Jensen. I'm still teaching in South Carolina. I've been teaching for four years, and I'm getting really into literacy and everything. And so I feel like you guys have alluded to it, but I'm not. Like, I just kind of want to hear it more fully explained. Like, for me, in the art classroom, it would make sense to do looking closely first because that's gonna be one of those foundational skills that you're gonna use throughout the rest of the year and the way you were talking about cycling back to it. Yeah. Um, and so my question is, is like what kind of vertical thinking went into this, like within a grade level and then also through the grade levels? And then for like the teachers, are you seeing a difference in like, cause I'm assuming you all plan vertically. And so like, are you seeing a difference where like your 10th grade students are coming knowing the skills better than they did previously, like coming from ninth grade? Yeah, the teachers might know, know that more because they're seeing that happen. <laughs> um, vertical articulation is work to be done um, in the future. We, we like right squarely on our radar. Um, that's, I want to do a lot more on the vertical sequencing of what it means to be an ETS student, both inside and outside the, the classroom when it comes to academics. That's my two cents. When we first started rolling out the close reading modules and the units of study, students really didn't understand what was going on. Um, they weren't used to reading and rereading texts. They weren't used to thinking deeply. Um, a lot of them came to class, complained about reading the same text that they read last week. Uh, but I'm seeing a, a huge shift in that now. Um, a lot of students are happy to see that we're doing something for an extended period of time. I, I will say candidly that this is the strongest 10th grade class that I've had and I can attribute that to the units of study. Uh, they're more driven to have those discussions about the text. They're really well versed in elements of literature. Um, I've never seen that before with a young 
group of students to really dive into um, the art of storytelling or the art of writing a text. Um, students are more engaged in syntax work um, as far as writing. So I think, you know, authentically, they have been growing. Um, and like I said, it, it was hard to tell at first because students were still adjusting to the units of study in the reading modules, but I know now, you know, a few years in that students are really engaging in the work and um, I know that they're, they're growing academically as well. Excellent, I think we'll have time for these last three questions, go for it. Hi, uh, oh, sorry. Hi, I'm uh, Rajni Rao, I teach in this, in the California Capital Valley in, well, California. Um, and I'm hoping to move to DC and hearing about all these curriculum changes makes me really, really excited. Yes, um, um, Yeah, super excited. We are DCPS. And I was, I was wondering, um, well, first off, before I ask my question, Ms. Thomas, have you ever considered like doing audio books? You should, because you have a really yes. peaceful, soothing <laughs> speaking voice. Mm -hmm. um, yes. you have a voice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, my other question for, the, uh, for all of you, I guess, is in the math uh, aspect of curriculum development, I heard you guys mention Learn Zillion, and I use it a little bit as a math teacher, and I'm curious what that looked like in the development of the math curriculum, and then also what a, a more scripted curriculum on the spectrum looks like for um, kids at different levels and accessing like performance tasks yeah. and things like that. Uh, for, for you say students at different levels? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll briefly address on, on math, since we're not, yeah. Um, we use LearnZillion right now as a resource, one of the many resources in math that fill the units of study. So when there was that, like, that little bar on the bottom, it's one resource that's in the units of, of study. They are coming out with a full math curriculum, a fully baked math curriculum, so it's something we're exploring along with many other providers. Um, LearnZillion, however, played a role in, in this work by doing more of the process of developing the the curriculum writers for the cornerstones. And they do that nationally. They do an all call for a dream team of teachers to work together on their own curricular material. That, that's who produces their stuff. Um, if you want to learn more, they're up here in the front row and you can come talk to Alex uh, <laughs> afterwards. Um, differentiating for different levels of, of learners. I think along with vertical articulation, student work and student portfolio annotation, video of practice, I think phase two of the work has to include um, continued progress on making sure that baked directly into the assignments are the supports needed for English language learners and students with special needs in a UDL, understanding uh, universal design for learning approach. We were, we were cognizant that we wanted to do that during the build process, not like a lot of curriculum which is after it's built, we'll give it to the ELL specialist, the language acquisition specialist, and they'll just put in the little boxes on the side. We wanted them involved in the, in the beginning. But I think phase two is gonna be to really make sure those supports are, are, are useful in helping kids get into the content. Ashley or Terry, do you have experiences, like how do you work with a student who's on a third or fifth or seventh grade level uh, when you're putting text or close readings at the 10th grade? Well, in literacy, we know that um, students learn by effective questioning. So we have those within our units of study. We have varying levels of questioning. So we start with some of the basic comprehension questions, and then we move up towards um, the more advanced level of questioning. Um, so I know that that helps students because it builds them where they are, and then it helps to bring them up to where um, we would like them to be. And we also have some resources in the units of study. Um, specifically, I know with the novel guides, there are a lot of graphic organizers and um, even vocabulary activities that we know will help students to improve their, their language acquisition. Great, last two questions. Hi, good afternoon. 
That was really loud. How y'all doing? <laughs> cool. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us today. My question is around the guiding principle of alignment, and I think that the curriculum and all the work that you do is very valuable as far as giving us the, the what, you give us the content, and even some of the how by giving us the best practices and allowing the teachers to be creative in the how. My question is the why. It's very, it's very hard to you know, articulate that. I think everyone in here has a different reason for why they do what they do. So I want to know what your why is, why this is important, and if you think there's alignment from the top to the bottom, which would be the students and the parents, all the way up to administration principal and your Very work much. at the DC office. Yeah, I'll take that one. I'll take the last question. In my, I mean, the simple answer is it kind of kills me that you asked that because I did a whole presentation two years ago to our leadership team around Simon Sinek, Simon Sinek, is that his name? Sinek, his golden circle which he says too often we start these types of presentations with the what and then the how and we rarely get to the why and we really need to start with the why and the how and then we can talk about the what. Listen, for me, this is about making sure that every single student in this district is challenged, engaged, and, and their mind is on real, rich, relevant curriculum. What, like the stuff that is happening in the classroom. And we've struggled for seven years to find the right levers to pull to make that happen at scale. So this work for me is about just kind of the, the social justice equity work of, of not wasting kids' time in classrooms, but engaging them and helping teachers engage them in really awesome stuff. So that's like the what of this work for me. We'll take one final question. Hi, my name's Andrew and I teach for Kansas City Public Schools uh, fourth grade reading and social studies and this is the first year that we have integrated reading, writing and social studies together and I just awesome. want to say this entire presentation I was thinking wish I had that, wish I had that, wish I had that because uh, I let people in the room know it is very difficult to be teaching at the same time that like you were saying I'm creating everything as I'm going uh, even though I'm handed a curriculum that uh, really is not uh, effective in my opinion. Yeah. But I just want to talk, my question is about the vocabulary in the elementary grades. Uh, for example, if you're doing the unit of study on weather, like you said, um, you, hit, you hit a little bit that you have a vocabulary program, but is the vocabulary that you're teaching all like tier three words of content specific on weather, or they're like the hundred words you need to know Correct. in third grade, fourth grade, right. and how, how many years have you done that and have you seen a growth in the vocabulary yeah. acquisition. So yes, uh, the, the content allows us to do tier three. Those are subject specific, content specific words like hurricane. But the beauty of doing content level stuff is uh, you do tech sets as well. And it allows you to do these tier two academic vocabulary words. If you're reading about whales for a series of weeks and you're reading multiple works, works about whales, there are going to be b terms that come up in whales that are these tier two words like ascend and descend. That's not specific to whales, but it's a tier two word that is important as power. It's not used in our everyday language like tier one words, but and we highlight those in our units of study. And if you have anything else on tier two academic vocabulary words. Um, I would just add that the, for all the content areas, we are pushing um, teachers to teach tier two academic words because those are words that people don't usually think to teach, like ascend. Like if they're studying whales, they're going to teach about all the scientific terms related to whales, of which I can't think of any right now, but um, they really? don't often teach like, you know, ascend or whatever, depth of water, or whatever. And those are the words that trip kids up. Those are the words that, as David Lieben says, like build a fortress around the text and don't allow students to unlock the meaning. Um, and so we call out in history, in um, social studies, science, and ELA, in all of our units, we call out both tier three and tier two specific words that are in those texts that, that teachers should help t uh, students work through. Sometimes by explicitly teaching, sometimes through the use of multiple texts, they see it in repetition, and so they're able to access it that way. Great, well I wanna thank everybody for spending the afternoon here with us to learn about the work at DC Public Schools. Thank you for being here as part of a, a force to make curriculum sexy again, bring it back. And please um, thank our wonderful panelists as well.